Good, uh, uh, good morning or good afternoon. Uh, good evening. Uh, my name is Xiang Yu, and uh, is my uh, I'm from the School of Pharmaceutical Sciences, and it's my really great pleasure to have the opportunity to introduce a few stories of work on the structural biology and drug innovation for the beta adrenergic receptor. I'm going to hide this and show the mouse. Okay, I, I would like to start my story by sharing this photo of myself. This, so this is a photo taken uh, in March 2020. At that time, last year, as we all experienced the COVID-19 pandemic, and that time the, the students are stuck at home and there's, the, there's nothing going on in the lab. So I think I could make good use of the time I started running. And uh, by the way, you should not run with a mask. When I started running, I bought a spot watch and monitor my heart rate. So here is a 20, 24 hours heart rate record of myself one day in March last year. As you can see here, that day I wake up, uh, wake up at around seven and then I walk to the lab and then, then I sit in front of the computer for the entire day. Uh, I think I was, I was I was writing proposals. Uh, in the afternoon, I went out for running for about one hour. After dinner, I play with my son for about two hours, and then I sit in front of computer again. The highest, the lowest heart rate of that day is 40 times per minute when I was asleep, and the highest heart rate is 161 times per minute when I was running. It is truly amazing that our body can quickly change, uh, quickly sense the status of the movement, either it's sleep or sit or walk or running, and quickly adjust our heart rate. This is done by different mechanisms, but one of the most important one is the sympathetic nervous system, which uses adrenergic receptor to mediate the so-called fight or flight response and the regu regulate our blood pressure heart rate or cardiac contraction. So in our heart, there are many two beta adrenergic receptors. About 80% of beta-1 uh, AR and 20% of beta-2 AR in healthy human. And both beta-1 AR and beta-2 AR are G-protein couple receptors, also known as GPCR, which means when they bond to agonist, the mediate the downstream signaling through the G-protein. But there are different kinds of G-protein subtypes in our, in our body. Beta 1 AR may need signals through the stimulatory G-protein, also known as GS, while beta 2 AR activate both GS and inhibitory G-protein, GI. Under normal physiological conditions, beta 1 AR is sensitivity activated. So it can mediate the heart contractility through the GS pathway. And at this stage, beta 2 AR is uh, not activated to avoid interfering with the beta 1 AR mediated cardiac regulation. However, under severe stress conditions, the overactivation of beta 1 AR is toxic, which may lead to the uh, cardiac apoptosis and the cardiac toxicity. At this stage, Beta-2-AR is activated and mediates, mediates the cardiac protection function through the beta-2-AR GI pathway. So how could this happen? There are two main endogenous agonists for the beta adrenergic receptors, which are norepinephrine and epinephrine. Norepinephrine is a neurotransmitter released from the synapse, and epinephrine is a hormone released from the adrenal medulla. Under normal physiological conditions, no epinephrine is a predominant agonist. But under severe stress conditions, epinephrine gets released and becomes the predominant uh, endogenous agonist. So the key to the normal uh, function of the sympathetic nervous system at the rest state is that no epinephrine has about tenfold sensitivity towards the beta 2 beta one ar as you can see here. This phenomenon has been known for decades and has been a puzzle for decades. Because if we look at the chemical structure of these two compounds, we can see they are very similar. It's only one methyl group difference. Also, 
if we look at the structure and the sequence of man alignment, so here we show the structure of the beta 2 ER, and if a, a residue is identical between beta 1 and beta 2, we call it blue, and if it's different, we call it yellow. You can see here, the also start bending pockets, which is um, no epinephrine bending pockets, are identical in the beta 1 ER and beta 2 ER. So if the selectivity is not contributed by the bending pocket, uh, what could it be? It could be the bending kinetics, because we know the bending affinity is contributed by both dissociation rate and association rate. To address this, we uh, performed uh, bending kinetic studies of no epinephrine to the beta 1 ER and the beta 2 ER. As you can see, no epinephrine has about 20 times faster association rate in the beta 1 ER than beta 2 ER, and comparable off rate, which means it's the association rate that determines no epinephrine selectivity towards the beta 1 ER. So which part of the receptor determines the association rate? Could it be the extracellular part or the intracellular part? Because the extracellular part is a bending pathway where the intracellular part is uh, controls the dynamics of the receptor uh, changing between inactive state and active state. To address this, we generate two chimeral receptors, one with the extracellular part of beta 2 ER and the intracellular part of beta 1 ER, and the other with the extracellular part of beta 1 and intracellular beta 2. And we performed the uh, bending kinetic studies to these chimeral receptors. And we found that the chimeral receptor with the extracellular for beta 1 ER also shows much faster associ association rate for no epinephrine. This would, would indicate it's the extracellular structure that determines the association rate and thus the, uh, the no epinephrine sensitivity towards the beta 1 ER. And we want to know the more details. And to do that, we need a high resolution structure of the human beta 1 ER. However, despite Bit one AR is uh, such an important drug target. There's no human bit one AR structure being reported before. That is because the very similar bit two AR is one of the best studied GBCR uh, structure wise. And this is mainly done by the Kobiak lab and collaborators. Right now, there are around 35 structure entries in the PDB of human bit two AR. And here I show a few examples of bit two AR inactive state and active state. Furthermore, there is a homolog of beta 1 ER. The Turkey beta 1 ER is another well-studied GBCR. <clears throat> and this is mainly done by the TIT group and collaborators. And uh, right now, there are about 26 structure entries in the PDB for Turkey beta 1 ER. And here I show you a few examples of inactive state and active state Turkey beta 1 ER. Um, however, the Turkey bit one ER and the human bit one ER has different extracellular surface, as you can see here, and different affinity towards no epinephrine and epinephrine. Furthermore, uh, despite we have over 60 structure entries of human beta 2 and the Turkey bit one in the PDB, there's no structure of the original receptor bound with no epinephrine. So we don't know if there's, there will be a, some side chain or re rearrangement when no epinephrine bind to the receptor. To address this, uh, these uh, questions, we decide to solve the structure of the human bit one ER. And after solving some technical problems, we uh, solved the crystal structure of uh, human bit one ER encompassed with Carzol, the antagonist, and the active state of bit one ER encompassed with as a BI, the high affinity agonist, or endogenous agonist, epinephrine and no epinephrine. Once we solve the structure, we look at the catecholamine kind of, kind of binding pocket, and as we can imagine, they are very similar between beta 1 ER and beta 2 ER. Um, also, we notice that there's no side chain rearrangement when no epinephrine bind to the pocket. So the also the pocket different could not explain the selectivity. But if we look at the extracellular surface, we could say beta 1 ER and beta 2 ER are quite different, either in inactive conformation or in active conformation. With the structure or collaborator, ULAS and uh, Peter Gomez group 
performed metadynamic simulations and to, to, to find out how norepinephrine bind to the receptor. And here shows a simplified result. Basically, he found that uh, for both beta-1A and beta-2AR, norepinephrine first contact the receptor through a negative charge, two negative charge radius. In beta-1AR, is uh, these two aspartic acid colored in green, and in beta-2AR is this aspartic acid and glutamate colored in green. And after the first uh, intention, the ligand moves inward, further inward, and to this position. At this stage, the, the ligands need to pass through an aromatic gate formed by two aromatic residues. In beta-1-AR is this two phylaline, and in beta-2-AR is this phylaline with this tyrosine to this position. And after that, it gets uh, bent to the final orthostatic position. So even though the ligand bends to similar position in beta-1-AR and beta-2-AR, the bending pathway are quite different. We analyzed the bending pathway and we found that there are six residues different between the bit one and bit two along the ligand bending pathway. We exchange these six residues and mix uh, six, uh, six, uh, six residue mutations in bit one and bit two ER. And we found that the mutation can decrease norepinephrine's affinity to the bit one ER and increase its affinity to the bit two ER. We further show that the mutation mainly affects the association rate. <coughs> so what about epinephrine? Jonas also performed metadynamic simulations for the epinephrine bending. And interestingly, we found that epinephrine takes similar bending pathway as norepinephrine. That is to say, it also takes different pathway in B2ER and b 2 er So how could norepinephrine be B2ER senative when epinephrine is not. We take another close look at the structure and we found that with the addition of the methyl group, it changes the charge distribution and the result, this nitrogen is less positively charged in epinephrine compared to norepinephrine. And we analyzed the charge distribution for the bending pathway, we found that in beta-1-AR, the bending pathway is composed of a continuous negatively charged tunnel, while in bit 2 ar is composed of a two negative charged region linked by a neutral gap. So we propose that before, because of the charge difference, maybe no epinephrine has a preference for bit 1 ar while epinephrine does not. Indeed, we plot the free energy profile along the bending events, and we found that epinephrine shows similar uh, energy profile during the bending, where no epinephrine shows clear difference. And we notice that no epinephrine seems to be uh, transiently trapped in a no minimal uh, pocket position. We found this position and, uh, sorry, we performed unbiased MD simulation for, for this position. We found that this uh, no epinephrine can stably bend to this position over 1.2 microsecond of simulation. So we propose that because it's trapped in this position, no epinephrine has slower association rate in the beta 2 ER. The result was published on Cell Research last year. Um, so how could the structure guide uh, drug development? development? More specifically, how could the structure work guide subtype selective drug development. As I, as I just proposed, epinephrine bends to the receptor through two different uh, entrance pathways. So we would think if we rigidify the catecholamide, it may have different effects on the bending because the ligand need to go through different, uh, uh, different uh, pathways and, and uh, adopt different conformations. So once we re restrict the confirmation, it may have different effects. Furthermore, during the study, we noticed that this phyla annual 45.52, uh, uh, there's a special name, name system in GBCR, which means this is a residue in ECL2. Um, even though it's a phyla annual in both beta one ER and beta 2 ER, it has different environments. 
So in beta 2 AR, this filaggin is surrounded by two aromatic residues, and none of them are, uh, are, are the same in the beta 1 AR. We mutate this filaggin to RNA, and we found that the mutation has different effects in the in beta 1 AR and beta 2 AR. So it uh, uh, has large effect in reducing no epinephrine or epinephrine affinity in the beta 1 AR compared to beta 2 AR. Uh, based on these two reasons, one is that we want to richify the ligand. Second is that we want to try to uh, enhance the interaction of the ligand with this field anion. We propose to, we decided to do a um, modified ligand uh, to do something like this. In, in this way, we richify the ligand and also we uh, try to get closer interaction with the field anion. Uh, to do that, uh, there, is, there are about eight possible isomers to synthesize and all collaborate. Peter Gomez's group synthesized all of them and characterized all of them. Here's the result. As I said before, epinephrine is not selective between beta 1 and beta 2. Well, no epinephrine is beta 1 AR selective. However, if we richify the, the, the ligand and get, we call it a super epi or super no epi, both of the ligands become beta 2 AR selective. So it not only reduces the affinity, but also the efficacy in beta 1 AR. Actually, the super epi is about 200 fold selective towards the beta 2 AR. For comparison, so far the most selective beta 2 AR agonist is cementor, which shows about 1,500 fold, uh, fold selective towards the beta 2 AR. And it's clinically used to treat asthma. But cementor achieves this high uh, subtype selectivity by using this very long tail and extend to the less conserved extracellular pocket. But super epi achieves uh, uh, this also very high selectivity by adding only two carbons. And as you can imagine, super epi can serve as a scaffold for further modification. For example, you can link the tail to super epi and get even higher selectivity. So we were very interested in this route that we want to the reason. We solve the structure of super epi encompassed with beta 2 er And as you can see here, it bends to almost identical position as epi. And indeed, it has strong interaction with the phyla anion 45.52. Actually, the section of, uh, of, of this filaggin need to move upward a little bit to accommodate the ligand. We performed uh, MD simulation to uh, uh, super epi and beta 2 er and we found that uh, it's very stable in the binding pocket. Uh, as you can see, the hydrogen bond between the ligand and TIM5 are maintained throughout the simulation. But if we, if we uh, simulate super epi, in beta 1 AR, we found it's not stable. As you can see here, the hydrogen bond uh, between, uh, between the ligand and TM5 disappeared uh, after 1.5 microseconds and never get, get the restore of that. The results suggest that unlike the, the mechanism of epinev no epinephrine selectivity, which is because of the bending pathway, the lower affinity of super EP to the beta 1 AR is its bending pulse is not stable in that receptor. As I introduced before, the phylaanine has different environment in beta 1 AR and beta 2 AR uh, with two amino acid difference. So if we switch these four residues in beta 1 AR and beta 2 AR and generate the so-called uh, formulas, it can reduce super epi's affinity to the beta 2 and increase its affinity to the beta 1 either through beta arresting recruitment assay or uh, agonist competition assay. Furthermore, if we mutate these four reduce and perform uh, dissemination again, uh, super epi is stable in the beta 1, beta 1 AR with four mutants. So the result suggests that the different interaction with the phyla 45.52 is the key to the super epi selectivity. Um, a few years ago, we published a work, uh, report the structure guided development of M3 selective antagonist 
based on a single amino acid difference between the M2 receptor and M3 receptor. So M2 and M3 muscarinic receptor has have almost identical osteosteric negative bending pocket except for this residue, which is a new thing in M3 and a fit in M2. Um, again, Peter Gomez group developed a series of compounds uh, to introduce a hydrogen atom to clash with the filani. And in this way, we got a compound which shows about 100-fold selectivity towards M3 in, in binding and more than 1,000-fold selectivity in vivo. And we got the strategy and confirmed that the band the, the binding pose is as we predicted. The selectivity comes from the different intention with the leucine for the any difference. Uh, so that is a pre work. We are able to develop a selective ligand based on a single uh, different amino acid. However, in this study, we developed a beta 2 AR selective agonist targeting our on uh, identical residue, which is for any 45.52 in our case. The, the, res, the residue is identical, but it has a different stabilizing environment in the beta 1 ER and beta 2 ER. Um, so, this story tells us that it's possible to develop subtype selective drugs for GPCRs with identical associate pocket by carefully exploring the environment difference around the, around the pocket. And we would argue that high resolution structures will provide valuable information to gather research. And uh, so that story, um, we, I presented that it's possible to develop uh, some type of selective drug, also steroid ligand, but it's still very challenging just because of the higher uh, conservation of the steroid pocket among the different subtypes. If we look at the structure, besides the also steroid pocket and the inner side of the receptor, if we look at the surface or other places of the receptor, we could see there are a lot of places where uh, that has different that are different between B two one ER and B two ER. So, is it possible if we find a compound that can bind to other sides of the receptor and modulate the function of the receptor? That comes to the idea of the allosteric modulator. Basically. An anastereal modulator refers to small molecules or compounds that are bound to any places of the receptor of away from the osteosteric pocket. The first anastereal modulator I want to introduce is compound 15, which is the first negative anastereal modulator for the, of the beta 2 ER. This compound is isolated from the DNA encoded small molecule library. And this was done by, uh, by um, collaborator uh, Bob Nefko's group at Duke University. So, what they did, they used a DNA encoded library. Basically, you have a library with millions of compounds, and each of them are linked to a unique DNA, DNA code. And you perform affinity selection to the, to the library. Then you sequence the DNA and get the structure, get the um, chemical information of the compound. Bob's group screened like 190 million compounds and resynthesized 16 of them for further studies. Among these 16 compounds, we found that compound 15 seems to be one of the most interesting one because compound 15 can reduce agonist affinity. Uh, so here shows the agonist competition curve. Uh, once we add compound, compound 15 to the system, it shifts the curve towards the right side, which means it reduces agonist affinity. And compound 15 has around uh, one micromolar affinity to the receptor. The most interesting result comes from panel E, which shows the interaction between the receptor and nanobody 60, which is a nanobody that recognize and stabilize the inactive conformation of beta 2 ER. So if we add high affinity agonist BI to the system, it will reduce the interaction between the receptor and the nanobody. And if we add antagonist ICI, uh, it, it maintains the interaction. Compound 15, as I said, uh, as we show here, it stabilizes the inactive conformation of the beta 2 ER. 
but it can still reduce the interaction between the receptor and the nanobody 60. That would suggest that component 15 compete with nanobody 60. And that suggests that component 15 modulates the bit 2 r function from the intracellular side, which is very interesting because at that stage, we have never heard of any compounds like that. So we try to uh, find out the modulation mechanism, and we try to get a structure of beta 2 r bound with compound 15. Uh, we started, we, we grow crystals in presence of, uh, of beta 2 r in presence of compound 15, and we connect a 2.5 angstrom data set at 3 and 8 uh, in Japan. When we saw the structure from the intracellular side, indeed, we see extra density here compared to the control data. Uh, the density is a little bit stronger, but it's still very weak that we could not confidently build a model. So here shows two uh, examples of my first efforts to build compound 15 to the weak density, and uh, none of them are correct in the end. Um, based on this result, we conclude that first, compound 15 indeed bends to this position, and second, the density is very poor because the ligand occupancy is very poor. And the occupancy is poor because the compound 15 has very poor suitability. So we try to improve the suitability of the compound. And this is done by our collabor collaborator, Professor Chen Xin's group at Changzhou University. He synthesized this directive, we call it compound 15 PA. Basically, he added a polyacetylene glycol carboxyl group to compound 15. And we know we can add something, uh, add this tail to compound 15 because this position was used to cover to DNA tag. The new compound, compound 15 PA, maintains a function so it can also reduce the eigen's affinity for the beta 2 ER, but is much more suitable as you can see here. With the new compound, we got a 2.7 angstrom data set and so the structure. And the electron density clearly revealed the bending position of compound 15. Indeed, compound 15 bends to the intracellular side. And it bends, it, it bends, to, a, bends to a pocket formed by the intracellular terminals of TM1, TM2, TM6, and TM7. So what is the uh, anastoric modulation mechanism? As we know, if we compare uh, Inactive L2ER and active L2ER, or yeah, inactive, inactive GBCR and active GBCR. The largest conformation change from the intracellular side comes from TM6. So when our GBCR is activated, TM6 needs to move outward. In the case of beta 2 er TM6 move out for, outward for about 14 angstrom. Well, compound 15. Bands to uh, uh, bands in a pocket between TM6 and TM7. Actually, it introduced a new solid bridge formation between TM6 and TM7. So it stabilized TM6 in the inactive conformation. During our MD simulations, in presence of compound 15, the distance between TM2 and TM6 about three angstrom shorter. Uh, compared to the simulation without compound 15. So this is the first mechanism. Compound 15, by bending to a pocket next to TM6, stabilize the receptor in inactive com conformation by re restraining TM6 in the inactive state. So that's why, e even though this compound bends to the intracellular side, it can authorically modulate the agonist affinity, which bends to the extracellular side. And uh, secondly, compound 15 bent to this position, which clash with the uh, with, uh, G protein or arresting bending pocket. So that's the second, second mechanism. Compound 15 can directly compete with the uh, downstream transducers like G protein or arresting and interfere with the uh, signal transduction. There are 21 radius in beta 1 involved, uh, beta 2 that involved in compound 15 binding, and two of them are different between beta 1 and beta 2 uh, Because of this, this two uh, relative difference, compound 15 can, has uh, 
can reduce agonist affinity in the beta 2 ER, but it could not reduce uh, agonist affinity in the beta 1 ER. And the binding pocket of COMBO15 seems to be a general uh, steroid modulation pocket in other GPCRs. Um, study before the publica publication of, of our paper, there are two papers published on Nature reporting the uh, native steroid modulator of CCR2 and the CCR9 with, uh, with, uh, with a NAND bent to a similar position. So the second other steroid modulator I, I would like to introduce is compound six. Compound six is the first positive anastoric modulator of the beta 2 ER, and it, it was also found through the DNA encoding and library uh, screening. And here shows the structure of compound six. Unlike compound 15, the addition of compound six can never shift the agonist competition curve, which means it can increase agonist affinity. And, uh, and it can cooperate with either G protein or arresting or nanobody 6 p 9 So nanobody 6 p 9 is very important because we use this uh, nanobody to stabilize the receptor in active conformation during crystallization. So we, we try to co-crystallize the 2ER uh, with uh, nanobody 6 p 9 with uh, and um, also direct agonist and uh, compound six or compound six directives and try to find the density for compound six for a long time, but we could not find the density. After the struggle for, for years, we found that the problem is just very similar to compound 15, is that the ligand has poor suitability. But uh, I mean, we tried the same strategy as we did in compound 15 to modi modify the compound, but it didn't work. But during the study, I uh, noticed that one of the one of the chem chemical PEG, PEG 400 that we used to add in the crystal condition to grow crystals, if we have a higher concentration of PEG 400 in the crystal condition, it actually helps to solubilize the compound. So here shows the uh, here shows the crystal condition I took uh, I made. The, the, in that condition, uh, it contains about 25% PEG 400, and we can see compound 6 just precipitated. So we try to find the condition with higher concentration of PEG 400 in the, in the crystallization condition. And uh, to explain how we did that, I want to briefly introduce the method we use to crystallize the uh, crystallize, uh, uh, beta 2 ER in active conversion. We used a method called the lipidic cubic phase crystallization method. Basically, we purify the protein, and here is color blue uh, for clarity, and we mix it with a host lipid. We mix them together to form the LCP phase. And then we set up crystals in the glass plate. And if the protein is stable and the uh, crystallization condition is correct, we will find the crystals in the LCP, and then we can connect data on these crystals. But there are different kinds of LCP host lipid. In previous condition, we use a host lipid called MAG7.7, which has a shorter hydrophobic tail. But there's one, another uh, very commonly used host lipid called MAG9.9, also known as uh, monolin, which has a longer hydrophobic tail. So we found that um, because the, the 929 has longer hydrophobic tail, once it forms LCP, the lipid barrier is thicker uh, for 929 compared to 7.7. .7. And we notice that once the, uh, the protein or the crystals are grown in presence of 929, it often requires higher concentration of precipitant, in our case, is PEG 400. So we decided, we decided to change the LCP host lipid. And this is the result. This is a previous con uh, condition. Uh, we use MEX 7.7 .7 as a host lipid, and the crystal condition contains 5% PEG 400. If we add one millimolar of the compound to the crystal condition, we can see a lot of precipitant. And uh, when we change the host lipid to 99, the crystal condition contains about 45% uh, PEG 400. And in, the, in this case, 
the compound is fully suitable. So with, the, with these crystals, we collected data and we found the density for compound six. Uh, it binds to a very in interesting place called SL2. Here shows the overall structure. As you can see, we have beta 2 ER bound with high affinity agonist of BI, stabilized inactive conversion by nanobody 6 b 9 and compound 6 bind to SL2. So why is SL2 interesting? Because SL2 is a loop in inactive beta 2 ER, uh, in inactive beta 2 ER and it became a helix in active beta 2 ER. The alpha helical conformation of SL2 places this field anion, field anion 139, in a proper, a proper orientation that can interact with a hydrophobic pocket formed by the G protein. And the compound six just bent right above SL2. Furthermore, the bending of compound six requires a lip, uh, about three angstrom inward movement of, of TM3. And the inward movement of TM3 pushes and induces the auto movement of TM5 and TM6. As I said before, the auto movement of TM, TM6 is a hallmark of GPCR activation. So in this way, even though comma 6 bends to the intracellular side of the receptor, it can historically modify and enhance the Agnes affinity, of affinity, which bind to the also steric binding pocket as the astral cell side. There are 14 amino acids involved in compound 6 uh, binding, and seven of them are different between beta 1 AR and beta 2 AR. So, uh, compound 6 does not have much pan activity in white to white beta 1 AR, but if we mutate the uh, different residues, and especially these two key residues, we can restore the pen, uh, pen activity of compound 6 to be 2 year. In 2013, Brand's group reported the first uh, uh, pen of GPCR, which is this LVAC compound bound with aproxo to the M2 masculine receptor. So this, uh, this pen binds to the extracellular vestibule and uh, slows the dissociation rate of the Osteric agonist aproxo. Compound 6 uh, bends to a completely different uh, pan pocket and use it and modulate the receptor function through a completely different mechanism. Uh, to summarize my work, um, I, I introduced four different stories. In the first story, we found that no epinephrine uh, bends to bit 1 AR and bit 2 AR through different uh, bending pathways. And this pathway actually contribute to its affinity to bit one ER. And then we we show that it is possible to develop subtype selective osteostery ligand to GBCRs with identical osteostery uh, pocket by targeting uh, on a ident identical residue but have different environments in these two receptors. And then I show that. Besides also steric ligands, we can find other steric modulators of the receptor, and the other steric modulators uh, could activate or inhibit the receptor, and it can bend either from the extracellular side or the intracellular side. With this, uh, I would like to acknowledge uh, my great collaborators. I would like to first acknowledge Brian Thompson because the work I presented today are uh, mainly done when I was a postdoc or a assistant researcher in, Brian's, in the Kobiak lab at Tsinghua University. I presented a Chris Lobo work done by Xin Yu and Hong Tao. And I also like to acknowledge all the members in the Kobiak lab at Tsinghua University and my own lab for creating a present work environment. I would like to acknowledge John Joss Group at the Stanford University and Bill Weiss at the Stanford University, and Brian Schweik's group at UCSF, Peter Gmas Group at the FAU Germany, and Roger Sandhaar's group at UCSD, uh, Professor Chen Xin's group at Chengdu University, and Bob Nefko's group at Duke University, and especially Kulio and Spring 8 for the help with automatic data connection. And thank you for your attention, and I'm happy to take questions. Thank you, Xiangyu. That's a beautiful talk. Uh, 
uh, we are open for questions uh, for uh, people who are interested in uh, uh, this talk can uh, now uh, either in the Zoom meeting room can raise your hand and then uh, uh, type in the chat or even ask a question yourself or uh, maybe uh, our mo uh, uh, coordinator will uh, help to collect some questions from the audience in other platforms. <laughs> I may ask the first question, take the yeah. liberty. Uh, it's very uh, intriguing to see the compound 15 and the compound 6 as an allosteric uh, 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 modulator for the GPCR uh, 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 receptors uh, activity. Uh, one is a negative, another one is positive. And uh, as I can see, both compounds are actually uh, screened uh using a kind of a, 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 a in vitro approach i'm wondering since now you even have a structure to show that this uh, modulator is combined to the specific location of the receptors uh i'm wondering uh, does, does such kind of all-circuit modulators uh, uh exist in nature uh is there any in other words is there any uh, natural available uh, our starker modulators, uh, for instance, even exist in our body to bind to the GPCR receptors to uh, 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 modulate its activity. And another question is related to uh, the two compounds right now, they are all in the intracellular position of the uh, receptor. So if we consider, the, if you want to use them as a drug, uh, how how do you envision them to uh, uh, modulate the receptor, uh, you know, going through the cellular membrane? Um, yeah, um, that's a really good, interesting questions. So first one is about the uh, anesthetic modulators uh, in nature. It's like, uh, so um, as far as I know uh, that uh, uh, I don't. I don't know any nature on a certain modulator and to exactly the same position as compound fifteen or compound six, but uh, we know that several lipids actually functions as a certain modulator for the for the GPCRs. For example, uh, uh, for example, POPG is actually a positive certain modulator for the beta two AR, and I think PEP two might also have some uh, other function for several GPCRs. And uh, the second the second question is about the the, the bending post uh, the bending pocket which is from the intracellular side. Yeah, um, I mean uh, eventually uh, uh, as a drug we prefer you want to it want it to, to bend to the extracellular side. But uh, to my understanding, actually um, it's not a problem for especially for small molecules if it bends to the intracellular side. For example, uh, I think the the CCR9 compound is is actually uh, it, it, it's actually before they solve the structure, the people don't know it's an anesthetic modulator. People thought it just work as a also certain but it's actually back to the intracellular side. So uh, I think the, the small compounds is possible to just transfer just uh, travel through. Uh, across the membrane and bend to the intracellular side. Okay. I see Brian has a question. Brian. Hi. Hi, how are you? Great talk. Um, just a comment and then a question. Of course, sodium is sort of a negative, uh, a universal negative allosteric modulator for not all GPCRs, but probably 90% of them. Um, and I guess the first question is, um, are either of these near the residues that coordinate sodium? That's the first question. And uh, the second question is, um, so beta-1, beta-2 receptors coupled to GS, arrestins, and also GI. Um, and is, do you have any data that these allosteric modulators are bias signaling in any way, particularly the positive allosteric modulator? Um. So, um, so uh, could you could you just uh, just repeat the first question about the sodium bending, bending pocket? Uh, yeah. So, do do 
does either the negative or the positive allosteric modulator, do they interact with residues that uh, coordinate sodium? Um, uh, so for compound 50 and compound 6, no, they, 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 they don't uh, involve in the, the entire the sodium binding pulse. And uh, for the, for the uh, second question, if the other store modulators are, uh, are best, I think uh, for compound 15 is no because the bending pulse, the bending pocket actually compete with both G protein, uh, G protein and RST. And for compound six, uh, based on the based on the bending uh, the bending data, it can enhance the uh, enhance the effect of both G protein and RST. So uh, I think it's it's not best. It it, it can just enhance the intention. So the, I guess the question is, um, so beta receptors coupled weakly to GI as well as GS. Yeah. And uh, have you looked at uh, the effect on GI signaling? For compound six, um, uh, I, I didn't, I didn't, sorry, I, I didn't look into the, this data myself, but my colleagues are doing that and uh, I, I don't know the exact answer. Uh, here's a question from the audience. Uh, it's uh, 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 was one per IP compound. Uh, does a, does the super IP compound have any special signaling bias for beta AR? Um, yeah, at, at some stage we thought is a resting best, but uh, but. But it's not um, so. It's 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 quite difficult to um, to to find out if it's best or not. Um, so as far as we know right now, we don't think it's best. Has anybody ever done a, a kind of a, since there's a compound for a compound fifteen and the compound a, a, what is a compound five? Six. A compound six. Uh, has anybody done a kind of a functional uh, in vivo or, or, or cellular study of this? This I, 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 yeah, I, uh, I think Bob's group are working on that. Yeah, but I I don't know the progress. <laughs> okay. There's another question asking about how uh, uh, how can you uh, determine which uh, location of the GPCR with the course allosteric uh, effect. Is there kind of a pos possible way to interpret the allosteric effect? Well, uh, I guess if uh, right now there is also a stretch of confirmation of uh, different GPCRs with different other storage modulators, I think we have reason to believe that uh, if, uh, if a similar GPCR uh, use this position as an allosteric modulator bending pocket. It's quite quite possible that this position could be an allosteric modulator for for the target GPC as well. So that's 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 why it's important that we uh, accumulate information on the GPC and allosteric modulator structures because we get more and more information on which part of the receptor could be a allosteric. Uh, a modulator binding pocket, and then we can apply it to other GPCRs, and possibly we could perform insulin docking or other other method to screen for new anastomosis modulators. Is there any uh, uh, modulators, anastomosis modulators, uh, discovered from the uh, extracellular uh, surface of the GPCR? Yeah, uh, so. So, for example, the the M two masquering receptors a positive anastomosis modulator bind to the S three side. So, the, this L Y compound, the, the compound in purple, is an anastomosis modulator and it binds to the S three side. I see. Yeah. I would imagine that uh, maybe people can even develop monoclonal antibody to introduce anastomosis modulator. That's true. That's true. Actually, there are. I think there are several um, uh, antibody GBCR complex structures which bind to the actual cell cell or GBCR reported. Mm -hmm. 
Well, uh, uh, I don't know if you have other questions from the panelists or from uh, the conference room or from audience. Uh, if no, uh, let's thank uh, Xiang Yu again for the wonderful talk. Thank you, Xiang Yu. Thanks. Thanks. I will stop sharing. Okay. So, uh, let me introduce our next speaker for this uh, session, uh, Professor uh, Brian Roth. Uh, uh, Professor Brian Roth, uh, he is currently the uh, Michael Hooker Distinguished Professor of Pharmacology at the University of North Carolina Chapel Hill School of Medicine. And Dr. Roth received his uh, uh, MD and uh, uh, PhD uh, from uh, uh, St. Louis University in 1983, and uh, then he uh, was trained in pharmacology in NIH and molecular biology at Stanford and uh, psychiatry in Stanford. And uh, prior to coming to uh, UNC, uh, Dr. Roth was a professor of uh, psychiatry and biochemistry at Case Western Reserve University School of Medicine. And then uh, 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 he uh, uh, he had uh, Dr. Rose had published more than 450 papers in the general areas of molecular pharmacology, structural biology, and synthetic biology, uh, including 29 papers published in the top journals like Science, Nature, and the Cell over the past decade. Uh, Professor Ross, he was elected to the National Academy of Medicine of the National Academy of Sciences in 2014 and also the American Academy of Arts and Sciences in 2019. He had received many honors, including the Goodman and the Gilman Award for Receptor Pharmacology, the Pharma Foundation Excellence in Pharmacology Award, uh, a NARSAR Distinguished Investigator Award, and also the IU FAR Analytical Pharmacology Lectureship. Uh, uh, Dr. Ross, uh, today uh, his talk his uh, title is Structure Guided Discovery, Small Molecule Discovery at the G protein coupled receptors. And uh, he's uh, going to also tell us uh, structure studies using uh, both X ray crystallography and the cryo EM, and then uh, do uh, structure determination for drug discovery. Uh, let's welcome uh, Dr. Uh, Roth. Thank you. Can you hear me? Yes. Very okay, clear. great. So uh, thanks very much for this kind introduction. It's, uh, it's a wonderful honor to present the data today. Uh, this is, um, most of the talk is brand new. I haven't presented it before, and there's a lot of unpublished data that I'm going to present, and I would ask people not to uh, post the data on the internet. <laughs> um, and uh, just by way of background, this has already been uh, gone over in the first talk, but uh, G protein coupled receptors represent the largest family of druggable targets in the human genome. There are these seven transmembrane domain receptors following agonist binding. There is uh, dissociation of the heterotrimer and the alpha and beta gamma subunits then activate down various downstream effectors. Um, and this just illustrates one pathway. This is one we're going to, I'm going to focus on today. Uh, following this, receptors are phosphorylated, um, arrestins bind, uh, arrestins uh, inhibit uh, the ability, generally inhibit the ability of G proteins to bind, and then serve as scaffolds for various downstream effectors. And, uh, and because of this, um, really diverse uh, array of signaling cascades that GPCRs uh, can uh, actuate. Um, one of the uh, major goals in drug discovery these days is to find drugs that, that basically stabilize various states, either G protein or arrestin bias states. And I'll, I'll be talking about this a lot in my talk today. Now, the challenge um, that we have is uh, GPCRs can couple really to a huge number of transducers. Um, and uh, the, the ultimate goal is to would be to create drugs which are selective for distinct transducer states. So, for example, a single GPCR in theory could interact with at least 16 G-alpha subunits and three different arrestins. And the idea is if we can get structures of GPCRs with distinct transducers, 
can we use these structures to create selective drugs that are biased for one signaling pathway over another and are subtype selective? And um, so this is something my lab has thought about really for decades um, and, and others as well. And uh, in terms of what what would be needed to begin to address this question. Uh, first, we would need uh, sort of a generic platform to, do, to identify uh, all of the transducers that a single GPCR can interact with. Um, then you would need structures of GPCRs coupled to these various transducers. And finally, uh, you would need some sort of generic or facile approach for structure-guided discovery. And so in the first part of the talk, I'm going to show uh, our approach and our solution to these problems. And in the second half, I'm going to uh, present uh, brand new data showing how, how this can be achieved. And so this is the, this is a, a phylogram of the G protein coupled receptor superfamily. There are around 900 of these in the human genome. And as was mentioned, uh, over the last uh, decade or so, there's been a revolution in our understanding of the structure and function of GPCRs. And ideally, what we'd like to do with this information is take a particular receptor, for instance, this, this receptor here, uh, the 5-HT2A serotonin receptor, and discover a, a ligand which is selective for one pathway over the other. And this is something I'm going to talk about in the second half. Um, and so... And so to show you how, how we do this, I'm, I'm first going to describe our platform to identify distinct transducers. Um, this was recently published uh, by two very talented graduate students in my lab, uh, Reed Olson and Jeff DeBerto. And uh, again, the problem here is that a single GPCR in theory could interact with multiple G alpha, G beta, and gamma subunits. And before we engage in structure determination, uh, it would be it would be useful if not uh, required to identify the various transducers that GPCRs interact with, and the approach that we took was to uh, basically uh, optimize and modify a technology which has been around for many years called bioluminescence resonance energy transfer, and the idea is that uh, we can basically tag one protein with luciferase another protein with a, a fluorescent protein as an acceptor. Uh, when, they're, uh, when the proteins are some distance away, uh, when the luciferase is emitting light, there's no uh, activation of the fluorescent protein. But when they're close together, um, we get uh, 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 fluorescence uh, from, the, uh, from the green fluorescent protein. And we can use, we can basically quantify the ratio of the luminescence over the fluorescence to get an index of, of when proteins are in proximity. And, um, and many years ago, uh, uh, from uh, the Canadian group, um, they devised a, a way to, to tag uh, the alpha and beta gamma subunits with luciferase or GFP to uh, develop uh, breadth-based sensors for G-protein activation. And that's shown here in this little animation. Um, this is by the Bouvier lab. So basically we put uh, luciferase in a relatively silent region of the alpha subunit, uh, GFP on the, on the beta subunit. And when they're in close proximity, you get a high uh, level of breadth. Now, when they, when the G proteins, the heterotrimeric G protein then interacts with the, with the GPCR and is activated, there's this huge conformational change that occurs so that um, the luciferase and the fluorescent protein are then far apart. And so this decreases the Brett ratio. And so uh, in practice, um, what you can do is you can uh, basically transfect uh, the Brett sensors with the GPCR uh, and then uh, quantify this uh, Brett ratio. Uh, and, and in this way, uh, we can get a very precise estimation of the agonist potency and the efficacy um, for essentially any, any transducer. Uh, 
Now, the problem, even though these sensors have been around for for some years, um, the problem that we found in in adapting them to experiments in our lab was that many of the sensors didn't uh, didn't work very well. Uh, they had very uh, low signal to noise. And so uh, what we did, or what uh, Jeff and Reed did, was to uh, systematically uh, alter the insertion sites of the uh, fluorescent protein and the luminescent protein in the alpha and the beta subunits, um, taking advantage of the fact that uh, bioluminescence resonance energy transfer is uh, uh, dependent on both the orientation and the distance. Um, and they did this in a structure guided way and hundreds and hundreds of constructs were generated uh, in an iterative fashion uh, and, and tested. And then uh, once a suitable uh, G-alpha subunit was found that gave the highest breast spread ratio, uh, it was tested with various uh, G-gamma acceptors and beta subunits to eventually develop an optimized uh, heterotrimeric uh, sensor for essentially all the alpha beta gamma subunits uh, in the human genome. And to give you a sense of the of the sort of data that, that can be achieved with this, this is uh, a, a heat map for four sort of prototypical uh, GPCRs. And uh, and one of the things that I that I pointed out in the QA is that the beta adrenergic receptor, although it couples very well to GS and GL, uh, GS uh, uh, both short and long, uh, it also has fairly good coupling to several members of the GI family, uh, as well as the G15. Um, there are other GPCRs that are relatively selective, so this 5-HT7 only couples to GS. And then there are uh, still other receptors that are extremely promiscuous, so the neurotensin receptor essentially couples to every G protein except for uh, GS. Um, and so with this, uh, with this in hand, um, then uh, we can uh, systematically identify the transducers that a particular GPCR is uh, engages and then solve the structures of them. And uh, over the last uh, decade or so, uh, my lab uh, has, has been engaged in a fairly intensive effort on uh, GPCR structure determination. Initially, uh, in collaboration with Ray Stevens, and uh, Vadim Cherizov, and those are the uh, references in green. And then more recently uh, in my own lab uh, in black. And uh, uh, to date, our highest resolution structure obtained here in the lab is uh, 1.9 angstroms uh, for the D4 receptor. Um, we are fortunate to make the covers of cell and nature, not yet science. Hopefully that will occur someday. Um, so with structures in hand, um, the, uh, the next uh, challenge, basically, is to uh, identify an approach for structure-guided drug discovery. And uh, the previous talk showed a very nice uh, approach for doing this. Um, I'm going to show you our approach, um, which, is, which is a little bit different. And uh, this is an approach that uh, was pioneered uh, in collaborations with uh, Brian Shoykat and John Irwin's lab carried out by this uh, amazing team of investigators. Uh, I'd just like to highlight Shang here uh, from my lab who uh, solved uh, the structures that I'm, that I'm going to talk about today. And um, Shang now has his own lab uh, at the Shanghai Institute of Biochemistry and uh, Cell Biology, and I hope, uh, hopefully, he's, he's on the call today. So the, the first... Um, and sort of proof of concept of this approach was carried out with uh, with dopamine receptors. And uh, because of my my background as a psychiatrist, uh, I had spent actually uh, decades uh, treating people with schizophrenia. And uh, these days, uh, and even in the past, uh, virtually all drugs that are used for treating schizophrenia interact with dopamine receptors. And despite the fact that um, that these drugs have been used for decades and dopamine receptors have been subject to very intensive study. Uh, when we uh, began this project, there was very little structural information uh, 
uh, known about dopamine receptors. At the time, there was just a single uh, dopamine receptor structure that had been solved uh, in Ray Stevens' lab in 2010. And Shang uh, took on this uh, project when he, when he uh, uh, came to my lab and in a relatively short period of time was able to solve uh, the structure of the D4 receptor uh, at very high resolution and the D2 receptor uh, at, at sort of moderate resolution. And in both cases with uh, clinically approved uh, medications. And so this was, this was a great boon. Now, when we looked at the structures, what we noticed immediately was that for the D4 receptor, there was this, uh, this pocket here uh, on the right hand side of, of the nemonopride molecule. And we speculated that, that since this pocket was not found in either the D2 or the D3 receptors and formed a selectivity filter, that we could use this pocket for structure-guided drug discovery. And the approach that we took was to, to use an approach that we now call ultra-large-scale docking. And an initial uh, proof-of-concept study um, which was published uh, now a couple of years ago. And I think uh, most people now agree, sort of a, a breakthrough uh, study. Uh, we identified uh, a large number of uh, compounds that existed uh, in theory, but had not been uh, uh, created uh, synthetically using a database called the Zinc database, which was developed by Brian Choiquet and John Irwin. Uh, the zinc database now numbers billions of compounds, bill, billions with a B. Um, and in our first uh, study, uh, 138 million compounds were uh, identified from this library, again, which exists uh, in theory, and were docked against uh, the D4 receptor uh, and docked in a way to engage that, that, uh, that binding site on the side. And each... Um, each compound is docked in multiple confirmations, uh, typically uh, between uh, 500,000 and a million uh, confirmations, so that uh, in, in the computational aspect of this, uh, 70 trillion confirmations were sampled. Um, this required uh, a relatively short period of time uh, because they have a very large uh, bank of processors, uh, one and a half days, so you could, in, in theory, you could, you could say this experiment took a day and a half, although it took several months to set up. And ultimately, when the compounds were uh, ranked and identified, uh, a list of uh, around 550 were synthesized for, uh, for testing. And uh, at the time, uh, this represented the largest uh, number of compounds that were synthesized for uh, testing in a uh, docking campaign of this type. And it serves as a nice uh, training set, I think, for people that do computational uh, identification of ligands. Um, ultimately, uh, based on, uh, on the results from the docking screen, we predicted that in the library of 138 million compounds, there would be at least 400,000 that would be selected for the D4 receptor. And these would represent 71,000 unique scaffolds. And... Uh, and, and so in just a very short period of time, we basically uh, increased the universe of D4 selective compounds by um, probably two or 3,000 fold. And there actually are enough compounds that, that were identified, at least in theory, that we could keep all of the medicinal chemists in the world busy for a couple of years, uh, creating selective uh, D4 uh, receptor compounds. And what I'm going to do is, is just show you the very best compound that we found here. And this was found um, without any further optimization. So this is a compound that came directly out of the docking campaign. Uh, this compound has picomolar potency against uh, the D4 receptor. It's a full agonist. You can see that it uh, is a full agonist for G-protein signaling and a weak partial agonist for arrestin signaling. So it's a G-protein biased uh, D4 agonist. And uh, this compound also is absolutely selective for the D4 receptor, has no affinity for uh, any other dopamine receptors, and was tested against a library of uh, 318 
uh, GPCRs uh, that, that we have developed in the lab and has no activity against any of the ones that were tested. So um, in a relatively uh, short period of time without any additional medicinal chemistry, we were able to identify um, this very potent selective and biased uh, agonist for the D4 receptor. Um, now, in the previous uh, talk in the Q&A, there was some question about whether these, you know, compounds that are discovered have any, any physiological or pharmacological activity. And so we gave one of these compounds to uh, Mark Carone, who's a colleague of mine at uh, Duke University just down the road. And he had, uh, he had identified some years ago mice that were missing the dopamine transporter. And these mice are extremely hyperactive. So I think you can see this, uh, this mouse in black here running around the cage. Um, so that's a dopamine transporter knockout mouse. Now, when uh, one of these compounds was given to a dopamine transporter knockout mouse, you can see here in the lower left-hand side here, the mouse is just um, sitting in the corner grooming himself whereas a mouse that has been given vehicle is, uh, is engaged, still engaging in hyperactivity. So it attenuates this hyperactivity in the dopamine transporter knockout mouse. Now, this doesn't mean that uh, these compounds are going to be effective for treating, say, attention, uh, attention deficit hyperactivity disorder or mania or, or anything else, but it, although, although they could uh, potentially be effective for, for those diseases. But it does show you the power of this approach for um, sort of very quickly zeroing in on drug-like compounds, which might have uh, beneficial effects in, uh, in rodent models of disease. And so with that as a prelude, um, I'd like to get to the main part of my talk, which is, to, is our approach to discover uh, biased uh, compounds for a particular serotonin receptor that I've been interested in for many years, the 5-HT2A uh, serotonin receptor. And just by way of background, uh, serotonin is a neurotransmitter and uh, modulator that's important for uh, many brain functions, uh, emotion, memory, cognition, perception, feeding. Um, also has important effects outside the brain, regulation of vascular smooth muscle contraction, platelet aggregation, uh, regulation of gastrointestinal uh, functions, sexual functions, and so on. And uh, if you go to PubMed, uh, you'll find at least 150,000 papers devoted to serotonin and serotonin receptors. Um, despite this, until recently, we had really no idea uh, of the structure and function of serotonin receptors. And that's something uh, my lab has worked uh, very uh, hard on over the last few years to remedy. Um, and so the particular receptor family I'm going to talk about today, so there are seven uh, families of serotonin receptors, 5-HT1 through 5-HT7. Each of these families has many subgroups. Uh, they're all G-protein coupled receptors except for the 5-HT3, which is a cation channel. And the particular uh, receptor family we're going to focus on today are the five, is the 5-HT2 family of receptors, which include the 2A, the 2B, and the 2C. You can read about this in a review that we published some years ago. The 5-HT2A receptor is, appears to be very important for the me mediating the actions of um, a really interesting class of drugs called psychedelics, which are uh, in the news these days as potential uh, treatments for uh, mood disorders, as well as antipsychotic drugs. So psychedelics activate the receptor. Many antipsychotic drugs are antagonists. The 5-HT2B receptor, uh, by contrast, is involved in drug-induced heart disease. Um, so drugs like FenFen and other drugs that cause uh, valvular heart disease do this through activating the 5-HT2B receptor, something my lab discovered many years ago. And the 5-HT2C appears to be important for regulating feeding, and uh, so drugs that are active against it uh, have the potential and are approved for treating obesity and potentially have anti-addictive properties. Um, now, over, over probably the last decade, it has be become clear from many studies uh, from my lab and other labs that uh, drugs that are G-protein biased at this family of receptors 
likely would be uh, therapeutic for for many many disorders you can see them here depression anxiety schizophrenia substance abuse and obesity whereas uh, the arrest and bias pathway appears to be involved in many side effects particularly valvular heart disease uh, the psychedelic actions of drugs and and the fact that uh, that engaging the arrestant pathway induces desensitization if you had and loss of activity if you had drugs that engage the g protein uh, pathways they would be less susceptible to less susceptible to desensitization hence would be useful over longer periods of time um, the other problem is that virtually all the drugs are non-selective um, and and to give you a sense of, of sort of the complexity of this of, of this um, family, here we have uh, two sort of prototypical drugs. On the left, we have uh, LSD, which is sort of the um, exemplar of a psychedelic drug. It's beta rest and biased. We published this uh, some years ago in my lab. And then on the right, uh, there's a compound which is nearly identical in structure. Uh, which is lysuride, which is non-psychedelic, and uh, which is G-protein biased. And both of these drugs have potent activity at both serotonin and dopamine receptors. And so one of the problems here is that structural analogs uh, show striking differences in activity. Um, the other problem is that uh, the residues in the binding pocket are, are highly conserved among various uh, serotonin receptors, um, as we have pointed out uh, in, in two recent papers, um, the 5-HT2A receptor, um, for instance, has uh, only a single uh, amino acid different, difference from uh, many of the other serotonin receptors at a, at a particular point in the, in the binding pocket, this, this serine uh, in helix-6. And uh, uh, based on Based on this, we, we actually, as I'll show you later, we're using this, uh, this one amino acid difference for structure-guided uh, drug discovery. And so before we, before we then undertook uh, structural studies of the transducer complexes, we profiled the 5-HT2A receptor with our um, TruePath um, transducerome uh, platform. And we found that uh, the 5-HT2A receptor is, is very selective, basically, for GQ-coupled uh, G-proteins, very little activity at others. And in the brain, uh, the only uh, GQ re, uh, transducer that's expressed at any level is G-alpha-Q, so G11 and G15 are not expressed in the brain. So we set out to solve the structure of the 5-HT2A receptor complex with the GQ. And this was um, a collaborative study that was uh, taken uh, on by Ku in my lab, uh, an extremely talented postdoc who did all the, the protein purification and then uh, and mutagenesis and functional studies. And then Uliana in Yorgos Skiniotis's lab uh, uh, put, the, put the protein samples on the grid and uh, solved the structure by cryo-EM. And this is the structure of the 5-HT2A receptor coupled to G-alpha-Q, uh, stabilized, of course, by a nanobody. Uh, this was the first uh, GPCR structure with uh, G-alpha-Q um, solved. And um, you can see that uh, uh, the ligand uh, was, uh, was clearly visible in the binding pocket. Um, The alpha-5 helix of G-alpha-Q enters the core of the receptor, as is, as is similar from other, other structures. The binding pocket was relatively open, uh, as you can see here. Uh, unlike uh, binding pockets uh, for arrestant bias ligands, um, this was a relatively interesting compound that uh, engaged deep into the core of the receptor. Um, and simultaneously, we also uh, identified uh, structure, uh, crystal structures of the 5-HT2A receptor with the arrest and bias ligand uh, LSD and with the inverse agonist uh, methiothepin. And uh, we then were able to uh, have a complete sort of uh, repertoire of structures going from 
completely inactive to uh, partially active arrested bias to fully active uh, G protein coupled. And this allowed us to identify the various active state transitions that occur in the receptor. Um, there are uh, residues that uh, show uh, pronounced uh, uh, translocations that are involved in interacting with G-alpha-Q. There also is this very nice collapse of the sodium pocket. As I mentioned, uh, sodium is a uh, near universal negative allosteric modulator for GPCRs. Um, there is this huge translocation of this uh, uh, tryptophan. Uh, those of you who study uh, GPCRs know this as the toggle switch tryptophan. And then opening up of the extracellular surface. And uh, this opening up of the extracellular surface for the, for the GQ-coupled receptor was uh, a little surprising, but we've now seen it in many, many structures um, and appears to be uh, a hallmark of, of this particular family of receptors. Um, to look at uh, some of the interactions in a bit more detail, um, very strong interaction, uh, as might be expected, between uh, the second intracellular loop of the 5-HT2A receptor and uh, via hydrophobic interactions in G-alpha-Q. And you can note this uh, very close proximity when this uh, residue was mutated, of course, uh, interaction with G-alpha-Q was uh, completely abrogated. There also was uh, interact, there also were uh, strong interactions with the with the uh, G protein outside, um, the uh, 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 alpha five helix, um, which are important for uh, specific interactions with uh, G alpha Q. So, so that's the published data. And now I'd like to get to uh, the unpublished data. So. What we had at this stage then was a, a structure of the of a sort of prototypical 5-HT2 family receptor uh, coupled to G-alpha-Q. And uh, we realized that there were several other structures that we needed before we could begin structure-guided drug discovery. One would be uh, binding of the receptor to uh, in the G-alpha-Q form to a G-alpha-Q biased agonist as well well as uh, structures of the receptor coupled to arrestin with uh, unbiased and biased agonists. And we were assisted in the cryo-EM uh, part of this by Jimena from the Skinios lab. Uh, and here you can see her at the Krios. And so the first, um, the first set of new structures were um, uh, solving the structure of the 5-HT2A receptor in complex with the G-protein bias ligand lysuride. And again, uh, we needed this structure because we, we needed to understand why it is that some ligands bias signaling towards G-protein and other ligands bias signaling towards arrestin. And we realized we really couldn't understand this unless we actually had structures of bias ligands at their various transducers. And to date, actually, for no GPCR, to my knowledge, do these exist. So these are the these structures I'm going to show you are the very first structures of GPCRs with bias ligands bound to their, to their transducer. So the lysuride uh, GQ complex was solved at a global resolution of 3.1 angstroms. Um, there are a number of interesting interactions uh, that were identified in the orthosteric site, uh, which, are, which are shown here. And they provided some important clues as to why lysuride is G-protein biased. Um, in particular, um, there appears to be a pushing away of, uh, of a tryptophan here in helix, uh, helix three, um, which, uh, which, which appears to be, uh, essential for, for the G protein bias of this particular compound. Now, we had previously solved, uh, the structure of lysuride with the 5-HT2B receptor, uh, in the inactive state. And uh, this allowed us then to identify uh, trigger motifs uh, that lysuride engages for inducing uh, agonist activity as well as bias at the 5-HT2A receptor. So with that in hand, um, we, we next set out to, uh, to obtain uh, complexes of uh, 5-HT2 family receptors with arrestin. And uh, we were able to obtain very high resolution structure of um, 
of uh, the 5-HT2B receptor with uh, beta resin 1 with an unbiased ligand, uh, 3.1 angstroms. This, to date, is the highest resolution GPCR arrested structure to date, allowed us to identify uh, virtually all the side, side chain orientations as well as the ligand, uh, really for the very, very first time. And as well, uh, we were able to solve the structure of the 5-HT2B receptor with the arrestin bias ligand uh, LSD. So these um, these two structures um, are are really important and uh, serve as landmarks uh, for our uh, approach to understand the molecular uh, details of uh, ligand bias at this family of receptors. And before going into showing you how we uh, took advantage of these structures, I just want to tell you a little bit about, um, about how these structures were obtained. Of course, I'm not going to give away all the details because uh, the, the, this is not yet published or even written up. But um, uh, this, was, uh, this work was uh, facilitated by the use of a fab, which bound to the extracellular surface of the 5-HT2B receptor. Um, we found this fab does not bias uh, signaling uh, to any extent, either for G protein or arrestin, does not interfere with signaling or, or ligand binding, but does appear to stabilize the complex. And of course, we used a stabilizing antibody for um, stabilizing the arrestin uh, complex. Um, as well, we used a native uh, serotonin uh, 2B receptor tail. So um, this, this structure differs from uh, the other uh, <coughs> GPCR arrestin structures in that arrestin, the arrestin uh, is, is basically unmodified and, this, and the receptor tail is basically unmodified as well, as well as being very high resolution. And you can see the fab here interacts with the uh, extracellular surface. Um, as I mentioned, uh, because of the high resolution, we were able to identify virtually all of the interactions in the binding pocket. The binding pocket in this case, where the unbiased ligand is relatively open. There's a very large uh, interaction surface between the finger loop of arrestin and the receptor, uh, which is shown here. And then uh, we also were able to visualize the uh, phosphorylated C-terminus of the 5-HT2B receptor. And uh, the phosphorylated residues fit very nicely uh, in the electrostatic map that you can see there of arrestin. So there are basically two, uh, two main uh, interaction surfaces, um, one uh, with the phosphorylated tail of the receptor, the other with the finger loop here. Uh, and this huge, huge, uh, beautiful complex. So this was um, really a monumental uh, piece of work by Chan uh, in my lab, Chan, who uh, did all the protein engineering and purification. And then Jimena, who spent uh, several months uh, obtaining the cryo-EM data and ultimately uh, uh, refining the structure. Um, so now... Now we basically have everything we need. We have structures of the 5-HT2A receptor with an unbiased ligand. We have structures with a G-protein bias ligand. We have structures of the related receptor with an unbiased ligand bound to arrestin and a biased ligand bound to arrestin. And now we can, we can use all of this information to identify drugs that, that are selected for the receptor and bias signaling for one pathway over another. And so um, this was is then uh, a huge undertaking by this giant team of investigators here, uh, headed up by Anat uh, from Brian Choiquet's lab at UCSF and Danielle Confer from Jonathan Elman's lab at Yale, and then Tao and Ku uh, from my lab, uh, Yorgo and Jimena from uh, Stanford uh, did the structural determination. And in this case, uh, what we decided to do was to take advantage of uh, the Elman's lab. And again, this is all in published uh, information. Uh, with the Elman's lab uh, in uh, developing uh, basically diversity-oriented libraries, 
And one of the problems with the uh, with the libraries that are currently available, uh, which enumerate uh, compounds in silico, is is even though they are huge. So the zinc library now has uh, you know thirty billion compounds. Um, the problem is that uh, many uh, chemotypes are still underrepresented, and one of the one of the chemotypes that is that is not represented in the zinc library are tetrahydropyridines, which are uh, at least frac portions of them are found in many many drugs and drug like molecules. And so the Elman lab has developed a way to um, uh, create a very very large and diverse libraries of uh, tetrahydropyridines using a relatively simple chemistry. And so what they did uh, in, in collaboration with um, Anat and John Irwin uh, in the Irwin lab at UCSF was to create a library of 75 million virtual tetrahydropyridines. So these are compounds that in theory could be, could be synthesized, but do not exist in the physical universe. And then ultra-large-scale docking of the tetrahydropyridine library was done at the 5-HT2A receptor using uh, the insights that have been gained from the structural studies. And for this uh, project, 75 million compounds were docked. Uh, there was an iterative cycle of docking and synthetic elaboration and optimization. Uh, this was done collaboratively between Anat, Danielle, and Ku. And then... Um, let me just go back here. And then one compound, uh, ultimately, after several rounds of iteration, was revealed as a potent uh, and selective and GQ-biased 5-HT2A agonist, which we call compound 3366. And um, I'm not going to show you any of the data about this. Uh, you'll have to trust me that that's, that's what it is. But um, we, gave, uh, we gave this compound to Ku and asked him to uh, purify, uh, if he could, a complex of the 5-HT2A receptor uh, coupled to GQ and complex with uh, 3366. And uh, he was able to do this, and Jimena was able to solve the structure at 3.1 angstrom resolution. And uh, uh, importantly, there was a very good density around the ligand so that uh, ultimately we were able to uh, put the ligand in the density in a relatively unambiguous fashion. And uh, gratifyingly, the pose of the ligand uh, uh, that was solved in the receptor, uh, shown here in purple, was uh, virtually identical to the predicted uh, ligand pose based on docking and free energy perturbation studies that were done by uh, Dr. Yang in the uh, in the Shoiket lab, and so this this stands then as a nice uh, proof of concept that we can basically go from multiple structures to identifying uh, residues that are uh, essential for selectivity, as well as bias. Uh, solve these structures using virtual libraries, uh, and then demonstrating uh, for the first time that uh, the the confirmation of the ligand in the binding pocket actually is is nearly identical to what was predicted. So this this turned out very nicely. It's always nice when when these things uh, work this way. So um, to end the talk, I just want to uh, give you my take home messages. So my lab has been engaged uh, over the last uh, few years in making uh, technologies available uh, in the public domain, uh, the True Path technology. Uh, we also have, and all of these are available through Agene, um, we also have uh, developed a, uh, a new technology for directed evolution in mammalian cells, which I, I didn't have a chance to talk about today, but uh, urge you all to look at. Uh, in collaboration with the Shoi Ket Lab, um, have developed ultra-large scale docking as a platform for the discovery of useful and novel chemical matter for many, many molecular targets. And um, I think going forward, ultra-large scale docking is, is now seen as, as um, uh, this paper is, is seen as a seminal and landmark paper uh, in the field of uh, computational chemistry. And um, uh, finally, uh, many new structures, uh, in, including those that I've I presented today, which um, 
were, are being used as templates for neuropsychiatric drug discovery. Um, and so, of course, this work is, is public is uh, funded by the uh, uh, by the U.S. government, uh, may, mainly by the NIH, as well as the Defense Advanced Research Projects Agency. And I want to thank everybody that was involved in the project. I think I I think I was able to thank them during the talk um, one by one. And I'm uh, happy to answer any questions you may have at this time. Thank you. Thank you, Brian. Uh, that's a that's a really uh, a beautiful talk, and uh, uh, I believe there's a lot of uh, interesting stuff we can uh, envision from uh, your data. Especially many of them are unpublished, uh, so uh, we open. Uh, to questions, if uh, anyone have question, can raise your hand or just asking or type in the chat room. Or we are also collecting questions from the audience on other platforms. So uh, I, I would like to start with two uh, questions, oh. Brian. Mm -hmm. uh, this is really interesting work, and uh, I found you had a very good um, success in screen for cheaper and best uh, ligands. Is there any special setup that you define that uh, that you know uh, so intention that you particularly interesting that lead to the success of for screen for cheaper and best ligands? Uh, like you know, you would uh, set up uh, that the ligand should uh, have strong interaction with TM five, for example, or something like that. Yeah. So we did. Um, so we we published on this before. I didn't. I didn't. Uh, I didn't talk about those papers, but we published a couple of um, uh, papers. John McCorby published a paper in Nature Chemical Biology and another in Nature Structural Biology on um, sort of structure-guided design of, of G-protein bias ligands. Uh, and uh, we identified, um, you know, as you might guess, uh, serine and transmembrane 5 as being uh, a key trigger motif. The other thing... Um, we've identified is that we want to not engage uh, residues in the extracellular loop. So I think, I think you showed on the beta receptor, there's this uh, phenylalanine that, that comes down in the, in the 5-HT2 family receptors, there's an isoleucine that comes down. Yeah. And what we found is that um, when ligands engage that, uh, they tend to um, cause arrest and signaling. So um, basically, uh, what we're doing is getting ligands that bind deeper into the <laughs> deeper in the orthosteric pocket and engage um, actually that toggle switch tryptophan to push it down and then not engage uh, residues in the in the extracellular surface. And uh, we think that that what's important for rest and binding basically is long residence time. Uh, and when they engage uh, residues in the extracellular loop, basically it, it forms a, a cap over the receptor. And of course, for arrest and signaling, a lot of that is in the endosome. And you need you need basically the, the top of the receptor to be closed. The ligand doesn't doesn't go out. So if you don't engage those residues, it's open up, and they just pop right out. Uh, uh, and so they're not able to stabilize that that arrest and complex in the endosome. Um, yeah, I have another small question regarding the fab of the serotonin receptor. And you said that that fab does not really affect the function or any sort of affinity of the receptor. Somehow, it stabilizes uh, stabilize the complex. Do you have any um, explanation on that? Or No, we're... We <laughs> <laughs> I mean, when you it was, it was fab, very... It yeah. was very surprising, so... <laughs> But I guess when you screen a fab, a fab you would, uh, you know, you, if you just find a bander, you probably get a few of them. But how do you select that fab and somehow it's stable as a compass? So this was just a bit of luck. This was one we had in the lab. So um, <laughs> I would like to say that we discovered it from first principles, but it was it was basically something we had in the lab that we, we knew bound to the receptor and didn't, you know, didn't affect signaling. When when it was first developed, we thought it might, um, you know, bias for rest and signaling. Um, it doesn't. It just seems to stay, you know, it just seems to stabilize the complex. Good for us, right? 
<laughs> but, uh, uh, you know, we're, we're in the process of getting arrested structures for the other, other families. And of course we're not going to have the fab. And so it will be, it'll be, you know, interesting to see how easy or hard it is to, um, to get that. It turns out that the, that it doesn't change the shape of the binding pocket either, uh, or the kinetics of ligand binding. It's just, you know, it's, it's sort of on the periphery there and it's stabilizing the whole complex. So, uh, it was just sort of luck, luck for us. So, Thanks. Uh, Brian, I have a question uh, regarding the uh, true path uh, that yes. we developed to, uh, 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 to detect uh, the protein interacting with the G protein coupled receptor. Uh, the, the, the using this method, you discovered quite a few uh, uh, G alpha, beta, gamma, or arresting protein interacting with the receptor. Uh, I'm I'm always wondering right now, even though we are uh, looking at the uh, the, the G protein coupled receptor or the uh, receptor complex uh, uh, from uh, 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 isolated uh, 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 molecules from the cell, and then using either crystallography or single particle method, the crowd EM to solve the structure. But I'm always wondering. Uh, in 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 the uh, real uh, cell membrane, maybe some of the uh, uh, the receptor proteins they may be also interacting with some other membrane proteins, forming certain uh, uh, cooperative uh, local uh, niche to work together. Uh, so, do you think the true path can help in that way to detect? Uh, other potential membrane proteins or other proteins that interact with the G protein coupled receptor? Well, yeah, so there are a lot of other proteins that interact with uh, GPCR. So for the 5-HT2A receptor, we showed, you know, years ago that a number of uh, PDZ domain proteins interact with it. It has a basically a PDZ ligand at the, at the end, so PSD95, SAP97, et cetera. Um, so the, the nice thing about the Brett technology is that can be applied to any, any membrane protein. It has, has actually by, by many labs. So the Bouvier lab really has, has, uh, has gone to town with this. And, um, uh, you know, you have to be careful about, about where you put the, uh, the luminescent protein and the, and the acceptor protein to make sure you're not going to interfere with those interactions. But, uh, yeah, you could probably monitor 5-HT2A interactions with postsynaptic density proteins and things like that with Brett. Um, it's a pretty versatile technology. You do you do have to be careful <laughs> um, to verify, of course, by other other you know orthogonal techniques. But um, it's uh, it's basically tailor made for that. Uh, you could do it by FRET as well, although the signal to noise for FRET is you know much less. So. The, we we actually have have moved almost entirely to Brett based reporters uh, in the lab just because they're so robust and reproducible. Um, it's their ratiometric um, it's a ratiometric detection system so that uh, basically every well serves as, as its own control. So you get this very stable signal, very very high signal to noise ratio, and highly reproducible. So. Uh, I see there's a question from the audience uh, asking, uh, what's the role of G-protein allosteric modulation? And uh, uh, can G-protein coupling affect the binding affinity of uh, orthosteric ligand? I think this is the opposite way of the signal transduction pathway. Yeah, yeah. So, um, so G-proteins basically are, and GPCRs, you know, interact allosterically. So the G protein is an allosteric modulator of the receptor. And uh, what's, you know, what's been known, actually Bob Lefkowitz discovered this uh, maybe 40 years ago, was that, was that uh, G proteins uh, enhance the affinity of the uh, receptor for agonists, basically, because they stabilize this agonist uh, state. And uh, he developed uh, this, you know, extended ternary complex model explain that and uh, that's part of his uh, Nobel Prize citation so it's it's well it's well known what 
what may be less no, less less well known, but is is true as well, is that arrestin, when it binds to the receptor, enhances the affinity uh, for arrestin bias ligands. So, um, you know, these uh, these transducers, there's sort of this bidirectional allosteric modulation that occurs. The receptor allosterically modulates the G protein. The G protein and arrestins allosterically modulate the receptor. Yeah. Uh, another question coming up is, uh, what's the situation for PAM and the NAM? I don't know what that refers to. <laughs> I don't know what that refers to, the PAM and the NAM. <laughs> <laughs> move, to the, move down to the next question. Uh, 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 this person noticed that the 3366 is a uh, similar with a uh, 5-HT or uh, uh, Sagosin. Uh, since uh, cytosine have uh, anti-depression effect and uh, hallucination effect, does the three three six six have similar effect? Yeah, it's you know that's that's a good question. It's it's actually not chemically similar to psilocybin or five HT, although it we do have a structure of psilocin bound to the five HT two A receptor, and they are they sort of do bind in a in a similar space. Um, so. I can so we've we've tested uh, three three six six in mice, and uh, uh, our data to date is that it is is not does not have hallucinogenic drug like activity. Although um, the caveat is that three three six six engages this serine uh, two forty two, which is an alanine in the mouse receptor, and so the mouse the mouse receptor actually has a lower affinity for 3366 than the human receptor. So to, um, to address this definitively, we've actually made a humanized mouse um, and we're, we're getting ready to test it. But that's the, you know, the ultimate aim here is to make a drug which binds to the receptor and does not have hallucinogenic actions, but is antidepressant. So that's, that's a great question. Mm -hmm. uh, the next question is asking for the reason of using uh, a tetrahydroferidine substructure to generate a virtual library. Why, why do you do so? Yeah, yeah that, that's a great question. Um, so part of it was uh, just the opportunity. So the Elman lab had, had developed this really interesting chemi chemistry related to tetrahydroferidines, which, you know, is, is not yet published, of course. Um, and uh, Shoiket and Irwin noticed that tetrahydroferidines were relatively un- um, unenumerated in the virtual library. So it, it allowed us to get into a new chemical space. And so the question we had is, is, you know, if we, if we developed a virtual library de novo, um, which was not, not previously enumerated in, in the chemical universe, um, could we find anything out of that that would be drug like? Um, so it was really, um, a hypothesis we were testing. Uh, and uh, remarkably, it, it worked quite well. Uh, the next one is asking for uh, 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 the five uh, hydroxy tyrosine receptors are good targets, but for most GPCRs, is this still hard to associate the bi signaling with certain disease? Uh, it, it still remains challenging, uh, basically because we don't have any good ligands. So we don't, you know, even though there are ligands out there that are quote unquote biased, there most of them actually are not very biased. And so um, the goal, the overall goal of this project, one of the goals is to make extremely biased and selective ligands so that we can test these hypotheses directly. Yeah. Okay. So this one is quite technical. Uh, asking what is the uh, ICFV used to stabilize arrestin in uh, the uh, 5-HT2B arrestin-1 compass. Is it still ICFV30 or newly screened antibody? And uh, any structural determinants in mediating the arrestin bias, the signaling of the 5-HT2B receptor? Yeah, so because we haven't published this, I'm not going to give away any technical details. <laughs> Not going to give away the secret sauce. Right. Um, yeah, but the um, so we have identified the structural determinants responsible for mediating arrestin bias signaling, and uh, as you 
my guess, and we'll report those when we report the paper. So I see uh, there are two questions related to the computational screening. Actually, I'm quite interested in this uh, aspect of your talk as well. So uh, basically, you mentioned about docking more than uh, 1,000 million compounds in uh, by virtual screening of docking, and uh, uh, the, the 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 computation must be uh, very uh, expensive. Uh, what kind of computer can do? Like uh, you said, like 1.5 days uh, screen something like a trillion of molecules. Uh, do you know what is the algorithm and what kind of uh, a computer that uh, is? Yeah, so this yeah this is published. Yeah, all of this is published. So if you go to the Nature mm -hmm. uh, 2019 paper, all the details are there. Um, basically, uh, the short story is that the Shoykat and Irwin Lab, or they're the world's ex almost the world's experts on docking. And uh, the docking program is one they wrote, it's called DOC, and they have uh, modified it to uh, handle these ultra large scale libraries. Um, and as well, they have a cluster of uh, almost 2000 uh, processors, so a large supercomputer. Uh, and they have, um, you know, basically they have optimized the computational uh, pipeline so that uh, even these, uh, you know, massive massive docking campaigns can be prosecuted in a relatively short period of time. Um, uh, uh, although I, you know, the docking just takes a day and a half, but there are a huge number of control experiments that are done before the docking is done, which, which takes several months. Um, so part of, part of the reason that, uh, that we've been so successful is that there are a huge number of controls that are run in, in preliminary studies. Uh, and those are all enumerated in, in the paper. And I believe once you have a high resolution structure with the ligand uh, in the pocket, then you can you even do more precise virtual screening based on the yes. structure available in hand, right? Yeah. Yes, yes. And then you can do structure guided optimization basically and do iterative basically. We're in the, we're in the, in the position now where we can do iterative chemistry and structure determination. Yep. Um, so it, the way things are now, we can, in theory, get a structure every two or three weeks. Um, of course, it takes a lot of resources, but um, once once you get a stable uh, pipeline for getting a stable complex, it's I won't say it's easy, but it's relatively straightforward to swap in ligands. Uh, and and iteratively solve structures uh, as you're as you're optimizing them. Yeah. Uh, this one more question is asking for uh, uh, are there are there ligands biased towards specific G protein subtype? Yeah. So this is this is a this is something we've gotten really interested in actually. <laughs> And we, there's another um, set of interesting receptors where we, uh, and I can't really say anything about it, but um, we have very high resolution structures where the receptor binds, activates both GQ and GI. And, uh, and we think that this will allow us to identify ligands that activate uh, one, one G protein over the other. Uh, and I think that, that would be great. As far as I know, they, they don't exist. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, is there any more question from the uh, conference room in the Zoom Zoom room? Seems that seems that we are right on time, <laughs> and pretty good. And uh, uh, thank you, uh, thank you, uh, Brian, for this uh, wonderful talk. And uh, Wilda, do you have something to say? Um, no, just on behalf of science, thank you. That was that. Those are both. Such great talks. So um, thanks to Zhang Ju and to Brian. That that was really amazing. Um, and you know, thanks to everyone for listening. Um, these these are great seminars. It, it goes out to so many people. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Mm. I look forward to our uh, uh, next one. Yeah. There's uh, many <laughs> others coming up. And thank you again for uh, Xiang Yu and uh, Brian for uh, joining us. Uh, tonight or this morning to give a wonderful talk and very uh, intriguing and uh, 
uh, uh, we learned a lot. I myself learned a lot from your talks. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And have, have a good night or good day. Bye-bye. Yeah. <laughs> Bye-bye.